We might as well get going here. So tonight we've got uh, Ursina Stedhalter and Andrew Boss. They're going to talk about their sheep operation and a little bit about uh, some financial planning stuff. So you guys take it away. All right. So I'm Ursina. I'm Andrew. Uh, let us know if you can't hear us. Um, and so we're starting off with a farm tour, sort of. And uh, I guess your turn. <laughs> um, we're located at Shawville in Quebec. We have 220 ewes, roughly. Uh, modif modified accelerated, so a bit of out of season, but mostly in season breeding. And we feed strictly uh, forage hay with a bit of barley grain alongside. And um, we don't pasture um, because we don't have an effective way to do that at this point. But all of our fields are in forage production for hay um, just for well, the livestock we have. So the barn tour is going to be a um, pointer, but it's the newer building on the slide. So before we get to the barn tour, um, our sheep flock is a little bit different from your average Ontario or even Canadian flock. Uh, our foundation is based on catadins, and we have the odd dorper mixed in, but the bulk of them are catadin based. And we generally don't have to shear, but we do have to trim up a few because we've started adding in Romanoffs. So we have a whole bunch of F1 50% Romanoff use running around, and they don't consist, not all of them consistently shed. Uh, we generally don't have a concern with parasites, partially because we're indoors and uh, the patterns are reasonably parasite resistant, but we stay on top of that with uh, test, fecal tests on an annual basis or as needed. And we exclusively market light lambs under 79 pounds, not just because that's what our breed excels at producing, but also because uh, we're in Quebec and in order to participate in the farm income stat stabilization program, ASTRA, we have to sell lambs under 79 pounds if we want to sell them through the Ontario auction system and not participate in the weighted heavy market pool. And we don't produce enough lambs to participate in the heavy pool, so it's fairly simple for us to produce light lambs. The bulk of our lambs are probably 65 to 70. Yeah. So 65 to 70 is kind of the weight goal we run with. Depends on the season. Market, market demand fluctuate what we sell at. So sometimes we sell them a little lighter, sometimes a little heavier, but they're always under 79 pounds to stay within the program requirements and to avoid getting grumpy phone calls from administrators for the various programs. So expanding on the breeding program, uh, the, like I said, most of our youth probably 60% of them are Katadins and the remainder are F1 Katadin Romanoff crosses. Uh, we buy in the majority or almost all of our rams and we make it a point to buy in purebred breed Katadins. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of Genovis data out on the breed, but we buy the best we can get from across the country. Uh, we buy in so far, we've only had to buy in two Romanoff rams. That's all we've needed. Um, they're Genovis tested, they're purebred, and the Romanoff breeder actually helped us pick out ones where the dams had a higher tendency to rue and shed their fleece around lambing time in hopes of passing that ability on. And for a terminal for these F1s, we're using pedigreed purebred dorpers and white dorpers available. Um, for the Romanoffs, actually, we don't focus on the kernel data for those Romanoffs. We actually picked ones with really high gain indexes for the breed because 
we warned some of the prolificity, but we didn't need to focus on that as much. It was mainly the out of season that we wanted to improve on. And we're mainly breeding for a composite type of breed. Um, our ideal would be like an Australian white, ultra white type sheep, but that's kind of hard to do. So we have bred our Katadins to either the Romanoff Rams or the Katadin Rams, depending on who they are, what type, or what their production record is like. And then the F1s are exclusively bred to dwarfers or white dwarfer Rams, and they are 100% pure. And then, so as we said earlier, we breed both in season and out of season. So we generally use MGA, which is a powder based, um, you can get it made up as a pellet. We mix it ourselves because we don't have big enough breeding groups. We're usually doing 60, 40 to 60 heads. Around. Yeah. And then they're usually split into groups of 20 to try to keep them as close together because we don't want to stock as many rams because but we want to spend the money on higher quality rams not quantity so we're using mga usually from march through to late june and in season we use just the rams and that's usually running august to december um we don't have a fixed breeding schedule anymore it's we've tried it didn't quite work so now we just plan them out eight to 12 months in advance, up to 18 months in advance. We have a bit of a calendar going on and we want to start lambing in late August and we want to end by May 2-4. We're very hay-based and our hay production is uh, over a wide stretch of land to try to get enough feed. So we need, yeah, we need different we need that summer period to not be lambing and it just doesn't quite work for our production. Our lambing intervals are usually eight to 12 months. Some of them go a little longer, some of them a little shorter. It kind of depends on where they fall into the breeding groups. And we rely heavily on ultrasounds to determine those breeding groups. Because once we get started with breeding season, we tend to stretch, well, this year it's stretched out just because of how it works out with the market but often we're doing rams in for 30 days, out for 30, back in for 30 as, as much as we can. So we need those ultrasounds to make sure we can put the ewes back in as needed. So now on to the barn tour. Okay. So the barn 79, 79 feet wide and 155 feet long. It'll hold four to 450 yokes once it's fully running. We uh, there's four feed tables. They're 10, 10 feet and change wide. Um, with all with the pens on each side. The pens have a eight inch step up to the feed table. So it's an eight inch step and then another 16 inches to the feed table. That allows for three to four months of manure storage. Um, the pens will hold 50 to 60 head, depending if you're lambing or market lambs. The ceiling's, yeah, insulated. It's, I was just explain that. It's insulated. We have that, they're called insta panels and we have those on the ceiling so they have an r value not like a super high r value I think it's 28 28 yeah, so. uh, but they produce just enough of an r value that it actually acts as an insulated ceiling and it really keeps the temperature consistent so it's not a fully insulated barn but we don't drop too far below freezing unless it's insanely cold outside yeah, the coldest the barn's been is minus nine inside, and I think it was minus 40 something outside. So, yeah, it helps. Um, we also have a recirculating water system in with the ability to add heat. I've had no problems with the water freezing yet. Um, that's pretty good. Uh, the barn does have a 20 foot service alley in the middle to bring hay in to access the 
speed table plus also cleaning out. And pen depths are 12 and 14 feet deep. The 12 is along the outer walls and 14 is in the middle. I generally am in the wider pens. I find it easier and you have more space for all your shows. Yeah. Well, we started this in 2018. It's not done yet. Um, we'll get into a bit of that later. But basically, we add a pen when finances allow and, and when we run out of space. So, as you know, it is. Yeah, this is a pen that's temporary at the moment. There's only two, two by eight to a one by twelve feeder. That's just housing feedlot yield lamps at the moment. It's temporary. Eventually, it'll be cement and everything. And that's a twelve foot wide pen at the moment. And that works. So this was what we ended up designing when we realized that with uh, COVID possibly creating havoc on finances, we still needed penning, but we needed to do something. And so we came up with this lumber solution, which we've used before and works really well. And it's already set to the lid. So when we can do it, we can add concrete. Yes. And then, so this is so what do you want this? like these are our feed cables like i said they're elevated there's a eight inch step and then up another two boards to the top of the feed table then a six inch board and we 4k to them three to four times a day and push up the remainder so the port the port one is the slightly brighter picture if you use staring out and they've got a what is that Thicker? Six and four, two by six. They've got a two by six to keep them from pulling in feed. And also the bales go on that same level. And there are doors at the end to allow drive through access in the future. Eventually. It also helps with ventilation. Like a here's the feed table where I draw my bale to straw plus plus my different types of hay um you just fork it to them once a day you scrape out whatever they don't eat into the pen oh i put the hay in with the tractor wrap hay dry hay feed grain on there it's yeah what else is there the tape cement feed table the lambs don't generally get out but when they do, they know about it for a long time, but we don't have a big problem with tons of them loose. It's usually just one or two that manage to crawl up and out and all or of, through a gate. Yeah, and all of our feed is, uh, I try to balance it all using Cheat Bite, which is a ration soccer program. And we feed unlimited creep to the lamb up until weaning, and then they get switched to a starter ration. Yeah, generally they go on dry hay first with a bit of with the same uh, ration they're getting in the creek. They go to dry hay and then we slowly transition them to a barley pellet or barley corn, depending what our ration requires for a feeding. Yeah, and we have mineral feeders in all the pens. There was. Yeah. Yeah. It's the white PVC pipe on this slide here, and they're just attached to the post and they get topped up as needed. And then lambing, we use, uh, we built a uh, lambing jug that was 16 foot hog mesh, just bent into a four foot square, uh, drop it over the sheep when they lamb. The joy of that is you can also grab a pallet and connect between the two you land the jugs to add another pen it's very versatile light easy that yeah with lambing my protocol is they get jugs for 2012 to 36 hours depending if they're single twins or triplets uh any triplets get a shot of powdered colostrum just to be sure 
um, all our lambs get a half cc of selenium at birth. And like we generally sort of move the the jug will be set up at one end and you get more sheep lambing. The gates get moved down to try to push out the ewes who haven't lambed yet. Because we do have instead We're of mis, yeah, and instead of mismothering, we get a lot of older ewes who are even younger ewes who like to steal. The Romanoff came to be they're really good feeling lambs. We have a we more so jug to keep them from stealing than to keep they, they can count. They just apparently can count higher than they gave birth to. Okay. Our handling system. And then our handling system is right now just uh two guillotine gates from Oakland with uh sixteen feet of with, yeah, sixteen foot panel like Runway, so it's eight foot panels. Um, move it pen to pen. We're not fully set up to know exactly where and how I want it yet. So you move it around the barn. It's light. It, it, uh, yeah, move it, move it to all the pens. And it, we can set it up at different lengths as, as we need it, how we can do it. So it's all dragging it around, but we can at least or any pen we want to. And then we just have an old hog scale uh, to weigh lambs. And we weigh lambs after weaning once a week just to keep up to speed at how fast they're growing. So we're usually looking for about a five, anywhere from four to six pounds of gain a week per lamb. That's pretty good for us. That's kind of where we aim to be. And then we just sort the top ones off. We have the trucker who comes and gets them and the Lakeland connects to a chute that was just built on it. I built an old, I took an old pallet and built it with a two by six underneath and a plywood side that lines up to the uh, trucker trailer and the Lakeland connects to that and I can have 20 lambs loaded in a couple minutes. Yeah, so and that works because we're paying per head for trucking and there's a volume discount, we'll keep them back longer so it's it's almost, at this point, it's, it's almost a struggle when we get five or six that really gain really, really well because we don't know how to fit them in into the system to get them on the truck and going. And then, and if anybody has any questions about the barn aspect, um, we, we have a side that isn't even got lumber yet. We still have our old Marwells just put up against there to add more extra space. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions about the barn, um, that, that would be the barn tour. Yeah, barn tour. Um, it's currently three, half of it's done and three quarters has been. Uh, Colleen posted a question in the chat, which actually is the same question we had. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about the Quebec heavy market and sort of what you were talking about at the beginning with doing the light lambs and stuff? Yeah. Um, so, so Quebec has a, it's similar to risk management in Ontario, only Quebec is called ASRA. And in or, so there's rules there if you want to participate about what you sell. Quebec has a single desk sort of selling system. So it's kind of like the hog pool where there is a set price. You can actually look it up. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know what it is right now for heavy lambs. But if they're over 79 pounds, you have to, what, you have to sell them through this uh, order form. And in order to usually there's contracts offered with the order form or you can do uh some of the slaughterhouses have direct buy contracts but you have to be able to meet your contract requirements all year to participate from what i've read and heard and then you get paid on an index so in terms of um benefiting you on your feeding programs that part's really cool and that if we were to participate we would get paid on the index per pound, but because we're uh, selling light lamps, we sell them through actually all of our sort of embryos. So 
they want like they have a basically supply management for sheep and they've decided to put all the heavy lambs in that and just given where we're located it would be really difficult to participate in the program i'm not quite sure if that answers the question but um you can sell heavy lambs through auction you just can't participate in the program and we wanted to be able to use the programs it's not that we're relying on them but it's another form of production insurance and in order to use it we have to comply with their measures and it's been relatively easy for us to comply with it because our sheep are really good at doing light lambs our average view is maybe 125 pounds herself and she's usually weaning anywhere from 80 to 120 160 pounds worth of lamb per lambing so we didn't see much need to try to expand into the heavy market and didn't need to really worry about that but it is there and it is uh it's structured quite differently from what you might be familiar with with ontario and that you have to go through the heavy lamb board and you have to get contracts or at least work within their pool and I think they have an open pool where you can fax in a form and say you want to participate, but they might not take your land. There's no slaughter capacity. Yeah. yeah. Any? Okay, and as far as uh, not having enough lands, like, yeah, you have to meet the weekly or their, I think it's the most spread out contract is every three weeks. And we just don't have enough consistent lambs to participate in that and go through the setup of doing the, yeah, of going through all the paperwork and hoping that we need a target only to run the risk that they might leave our land standing because we're far away from Montreal on our selling bakers. So any other questions? Oh they're all over the place. Uh this last group was hold on we've got it here. The last group that we just sold they were sold the first week of December and they started the sheep started lambing August 22nd. So they're it would have been just under that four month mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know what exactly. They're usually in that four to five month mark. It says we gain, we wean them at about, they're usually 40 to 45 pounds, and they gain on average about five pounds a week. So generally, we're still feeding them for an, at least another month after weaning. So yeah, this last group went out really nice. You're really happy with how they turned out. The sheep started lambing August 2nd and even the smallest lambs were or August 22nd. And all the lambs were gone by the first week of December. Do you guys have any kind of nursery setup for lambs that uh, need some extra help or need to be bottle fed? No. No. Um, <laughs> most of the time, if they need bottles, I will sometimes make a pen outside, but otherwise, I'll put a dot on their head to catch them in the pen, thinking about three times a day they can try to steal. Yeah, because the Romanoffs adopt relatively well, we've actually had a few cases where they've adopted lambs. And other than that, yeah, we, when we get. I think when we get over that four or five mark, we've, we've created a pen just at the end of the pen, but generally we leave them running with the sheep because we find they do better and their survival rates go up if we just leave them with the sheep and mark them. Um, a different color of spray paint. Yeah, and then that way it also makes it easier to, when after 30 days when we pull them off the milk replacer, they can go and they're, they're socialized and they know how to be. And they already find the creep that much faster. So 
I find it simpler. And they come to you when you step in the pen with the bottles. You don't have to chase them. So, yeah. Yeah. So our barn is, yeah, it's cold as it's been is negative nine. So it's not that, not that bad. They, they get up and they hit the ground running for the most part. Uh, so it's tunnel ventilated at the moment. So if you're looking, even in this picture, you can see the one with the marble. The, obviously, you can see that the sides are white plastic. Um, they're actually old dairy barn curtains that we were able to salvage off of a construction project. So they allow a lot of light in. And then the ends have all but one section open. And then so we can just lift all the ends up and the way our barn is oriented and the way the airflow usually is, generally it acts as tunnel ventilation. In the winter, we now have a fan at the back and then just lift one of the doors over the feed tables a little bit to allow air in. So it works pretty good. It gets kind of hot, but it didn't get sticky this year. No. So as long as we leave all the doors open, it the wind just kind of takes care of the air. Um, the orientation works out that way. And we could turn the curtains into useful things if we wanted to, but we haven't needed to fix the curtains at this point and make them go up and down. At this point, they're just bolted in place. Creep feeding. I don't think I had a picture of that. Uh, we have hog feeders, right? Think so. Yeah, we use old hog feeders um, with yeah. a creep gate at the beginning of it, and yeah. The creep, so the creep gate is off of uh, Marwell's creep feeder that we acquired when we got started. And sometimes we put the creep feeder actually outside of the end of the barn in the summer. That's convenient, but most of the time the creep gate's just at the end of the pen, like say the last eight feet, uh, put the creep gate in. We have a couple of other gates that clip to it. And then there are hog feeders uh, behind that that get filled uh, with creep feed. Usually it's either master feeds or Purina medicated creep feed, whatever we happen to acquire at that time. And that works pretty well. We did the pallet method. We did the pallet method for a little bit. For the most part, we just used the Marwell creep gate because it's easy to do. And you just flip it at the end of the pen. Yeah, and sometimes we flip over. Um, I have it. I don't have the video, but I have a video somewhere of uh, we got calf pens and we flip the calf pens upside down, and it's like the perfect size for lambs to run through. So, yeah, that's that would be every creep feed. Any other questions? I have one more very important question. Uh, what's the cat's name? The orange one, that's Furby. Yes, that is Furby. Furby is, yeah. We have a couple of older cats that act as pet control. They're really good at it. And oh, yes, we yes. use treated creep. Everything is medicated uh, creep. We've had two run-ins with coccidiosis, usually in our replacements, actually. So we're pre- good about making sure that they have medicated creeps and always had to do with extended because we used to only use medicated creeps for the first month or so. Yeah. For the first month or so, and then we were mixing our own feed, but that transition wasn't working quite right. So now we're using medicated feed all the way through until just after we move. Both. Uh, use a pel the pelleted or textured medicated feed we use both i use the pre the textured in like uh with rolled barley molasses and stuff it gets used in uh the creep feed at the beginning it's from purina right now and then after i think it's a few weeks i gotta check my notes i switched them over to a 17 percent 
pellet that's medicated as well. I slowly transition them later on onto a barley medicated, and then they go to the finished ration. So we have a number of rations, and we've tried to reduce it on a few occasions, and it never quite worked out right. And we're just back up to using probably, I think right now it's four different rations. But well, we've gone as high as seven just to keep everything straight. Um, just how it worked out. Finish the whole line in one shot. I'm not sure what I'd really change at the moment. The uh, service alley. The service alley, the first floor we poured is not quite ideal. It doesn't match with the lakeland very well, so it's very tippy and doesn't work as good as we had hoped. And it, I would build the barn probably four feet wider and put a uh, an alley down the center by the posts. If you ever have to fish one sheep out of a pen in the back, you don't have to go through the other one. And I'd also put a load chute off the end of that alley for loading lambs out. If I were to do anything different other than that, I'm. Then we'd have a lot more water bowls. We, yes. We have a number of them, but we just underestimated it. If, yeah. So is it a dirt floor? It is concrete flooring um, and the unfinished part where the hay sits is not concrete yet but uh, per Quebec regulations we have to have concrete flooring given the number of animals the barn is designed for so we actually had to get environmental permits we have permits for up to 450 sheep we have the environmental is it nutrition management plan pack something or other there's a binder for it. There, there's a binder for it we have permits and everything and the uh, allocation for nutrient management for up to 450 use and as a result we have to have concrete floors underneath all of them so for cleaning out it's a good thing for the bank accounts it's not Any more barn related questions? Do you, do you have any uh, issues with uh, water dripping off the ceiling or extra moisture hanging around in the wintertime? Have you been through a full winter yet? Yes, we, yes, we have issues from time to time with the water dripping from the ceiling. Thus, we installed a fan at ceiling height right now, and that seems to have changed the aspect of that. It's only wet right now around the big 20-foot service door, but that door is also, it's our newest installation. Um, we have tarp doors everywhere, and that one's not very well sealed, and it's adding airflow from the wrong direction, so we had and we had a fair bit of dripping ceiling going on in our first winter. So we started the barn in 2018 in July and within a hundred days. So yeah. November we had sheep in it. We had sheep in it. So this whole entire structure is actually built by just Andrew and my father. There, we had, we did it ourselves. Um, and that's also why it's not done or done completely and why we keep adding pens. But we've had, said this will be our third winter in the barn, right? Yeah, yeah. third winter. And this is knock on with the first winter where we think we've got the airflow dripping mostly figured out. And the next step is to add more insulation to the ceiling using, um, what's it called? Blowing insulation. Um... It's a cellulose insulation you can blow on top uh, it's done frequently in fog barns, and it'll go on top of the panels, and it'll make another difference. Uh, the last structure we used it in, it changed the temperature by about six degrees or so in the winter, and just sealed up. We have a bit of gap, and we might have to add a chimney to improve the winter flow, but for the most part, 
it's not too humid and not much of a dripping cave when we get the fans up and running. Right now we have one fan running. It's uh, 24 inches and it working in the summertime. I have a 36 inch fan I hook up and two 24s as well. Yeah, and the, the smaller ones are all usually at floor height, at sheet height in the summer. And the other, the other one is up just underneath the ceiling at the back end of the barn. So. How do you, uh, how do you bed the sheep? Do you blow it over them or get in the pens and shake it out? How, what's your um, bedding? Straw. I go through about a, I put a big square bale of straw on the feed table and I throw it in as needed. Um, generally about a big square a week when I'm lambing that obviously I think I go through a bale and a half to two squares a week. Um, right now it's about that one big square bale a week and you just throw the flakes in and fork it out by hand at the moment. Most of this is muscle power. We have one tractor and it just in bales and cleans out. So. Saves on gym costs anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's good for the barn. You can ask questions at the end or whatever. Send me a message if you have one. Um, overall, like we're pretty happy with how the barn turned out compared to what we used to have or what we started with. So um, we're expanding without adding additional debt. Uh, we obviously have a mortgage and the barn bills had to be financed at least to where it's at right now but we decided that we didn't want to add to our debt load and that if we couldn't afford to buy the sheep right out or keep them back we weren't going to add more animals so it, we only really grow with our own ewe lambs and i calculated this out uh so at the moment it costs us approximately 185 dollars to feed a ewe lamb through to her first lambing. Um, I base this off of just what it costs me to feed a ewe and what it costs me to finish a lamb uh, for our size. So we started with sheep in 2016. Um, if you, the longer picture on the slide in the coverall, that's what we started in. We got a coverall from family and put up the same sort of lumber board system bought a bunch of views we started with about 75 views uh we did it at the time because we were new and we didn't ask anybody we flushed the whole lot of them the day we bought them because they had been fed in over a week at that point and they produced a lot of lambs for us so that was our starting point uh we quickly outgrew the coverall and then also decided that we were going to move and get our own Property. So we're originally from uh, the shores of Lake Huron, Huron County, and we decided that the land there was not going to justify us expanding in sheep and we came to the Ottawa Valley. And when we came up here, we had 134 ewes and ewe lambs. And our first winter was this, actually these next, the other two pictures on the slide, we had them both inside and in an old they called it a riding arena, but it was really just a shed. And that's what we started with. Um, it didn't go very well. And we lost over a third of our flock in a matter of weeks. Uh, we have a massive problem with water. We have really high sulfur and they got uh, basically looked like polio all over the place. We found out we have MV. And we found out that somebody, because we our first flock was a bunch of starved sheep because it was during the drought in 2016 they had gotten into cattle feed so we were so we were dealing with sulfur toxicity 
we were dealing with copper poisoning and all of this at once and we ended up basically just saving 102 U's and about 60 U lands going into 2018. But we decided to go ahead with the barn build at that point because we knew that based on our experience with the coveralls, if we had the right facilities, we could get back up there. And we had other things happen, which 2018 was a really bad year. 2020 does not come even close to how that 2018 was for us. And by the time we got 2019, we were back up to 132 U's and we had about 70 U lambs. And it was at this point we got into the Romanoffs and they saved us. Uh, they are so prolific. They are so good at breeding. Those two rams that we bought were worth every penny. They bred everything we had. And those U lambs bounced back. They caught on. We found a way around the water issue. It's still not fixed but we have ways to deal with it now. And we moved into the new barn. And now we're, we started this year going into with about 175 ewes and about 50 ewe lambs. Um, we're walking into 2021 with, we have about 200 or so ewes, a bunch of ewe lambs. Everything's homebred at this point. We have almost none of the sheep left that we had bought in 2016, most of them didn't survive or got cold. And um, because of the drought this year, we ended up deciding that we can't afford to expand too much more this year. So we called older youth and we cut back just a limited amount of new lambs. So we're selling about 1.1 lambs per you, which cover the operation costs of the actual sheep. Doesn't cover the mortgage, just how it is. But it's, uh, we found the hard way that the first sheep we bought, they were sheep, but they hadn't been fed. So it generally works easier to buy better sheep to start with. That's what we probably do backwards. And we spend the most money we, that we can afford to, to buy the absolute best rams. So we've gotten rams from Saskatchewan, Eastern Quebec, uh, at, at Ontario, we try to connect with breeders who we like their style and their style matches ours. And that's where we spend our money because we look at every U as a potential to produce an offspring we want to keep. So we don't really have a two tier system. Um, our culling's maybe not as aggressive as it should be, but as long as they're producing and as long as they're milking and they don't need extra supplementing and they don't produce bottle lambs, we're pretty happy with them and we'll consider keeping them. And like I said, if we can't source the feed, we don't expand. If we don't have the feed at the start of the year, then those ewe lambs have to go because there's not enough to keep them. And yeah, so our sheep are all paid for and they pay for their own feed and stuff, but they are not currently paying for the mortgage on the property, which is, I'm okay with that right now. So how we do it is we, real, we rely on a stable salaried off farm income that we can use as our budget to pay our mortgage. And by taking the mortgage stress off of the sheep, I can then use that flow to uh, expand. And we don't have a line of credit. We don't have an operating loan. We have a small bank overdraft, but when we apply for a mortgage, they told us we couldn't get it. So we had to figure out how to expand and grow to our, the farm we wanted without an operating line of credit or anything. Um, we have found that maybe we've been able to buy the extra 100 ewes we wanted in 2018. I don't think we'd still be here. We lost so many sheep, but we learned so much in that year. And we've been able to expand our management skills and add a handling system. Like we didn't add our handling system until last year. Yeah. 2019. Yeah, so we got the handling system last year finally. In January, yeah. 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 And part of it was also we did relocate to an area where we feel we've got pretty strong agricultural supports and in terms of land base and everything, the, it works out a bit better for us than where we were uh, growing up. And that's kind of how we 
got there. So most of it is just budget and calculation. So you know me at all. I love Excel sheets. We have Excel sheets for literally everything and they are planned 12 to 18 months in advance. So I know approximately how many ewe lambs I want to keep next year, given as long as we can source the feed. I know that I can probably justify keeping those based on the number of lambs I'm expecting, the amount. Um, I usually underestimate the lamb price because I don't expect it to be like 2020. I'm usually working with uh, about a $2 per pound price, knowing that if that's my selling price and I can work with that, then I'm doing all right. Uh, we track all of the feed we use. So um, every single hay bale we've ever fed this year, including what cut, what field, all gets written down so we know exactly what we used, when we used it, how much we needed so that we can forecast what we need when we need it. We make sure we have the cash on hand to feed and before we read the use. So we want to have the money to get through. This is mainly as a side effect of not having a line of credit or an operating loan to rely on. We have to have the money to buy the feed to pay or uh, to feed those lambs up until we can ship them. Otherwise, the running out of feed or running out of cash to buy the feed before we can sell the lambs doesn't really work for us. And we use journals to basically track every event um, and what we need to do. Uh, Andrew's on the farm full time at this point, uh, just to make sure things keep running around and we cost share you hay production. So he exchanges labor for hay from uh, my family's farm where, so we can get some extra feed there. And we also map out all the major holiday markets. So this goes back to us not having a set breeding schedule. We do focus on markets. We produce light lamb. The light lamb is not in demand all year. So they do, but they're not really. So we try to both target our lambing base around market dates. And that goes back to making sure that we can actually afford to feed MGUs all the way through because they do cost a little bit more. They produce a little more lambs and it there's there's a cost associated with that so we want to make sure we can pay for everything up front and that we that we're on hand to do it because mm -hmm. mga is probably a little more labor intensive than cedars just from the impression i've gotten but it worked out better for us in cost we were willing to trade off labor for cash um, we do run two guardian dogs, even though we're indoors. We have a lot of pressure around. Uh, we woke up one morning with dog tracks and we didn't know the dog. So, uh, 2018 was really, really, really bad for us. Uh, I basically almost died and it turned into a year of learning. And out of that, we've learned that we have to live within our means we already did before this but we don't have car loans we don't use personal debt we reduce our spending when we have to so when the when covid hit we knew that we wanted to finish a pen in the barn but we didn't know how it was going to turn out and they were saying they might lay off people so we can slash our budget immediately within almost no notice um, we have contingency plans as best as we can, and that's what I suggest now. If you think it can't happen, you can literally be going to work one morning and then land in the Ottawa Civic for the next six, six seven, six, days. seven days and not be able to do any chores for months. And it's, it's about having that plan. And then last thing is an emergency fund. So we're, I'm really picky about this. I make sure we always have at least three months to six months worth of expenses saved up at all times, and that includes farm expenses. That's terrifying in summer for those droughts, and it's and you have to buy hay up front. But I want to have the cash on hand because I've seen what it looks like when suddenly you can't go to work and you can't do anything. So. We pay our credit cards monthly, and I suggest this to pretty much anybody. So probably didn't mention this at the beginning of this. I am a CPA. That is my day job. Um, 
and we avoid car loans, money payments and such, they tend to wreck your budget pretty easily. Um, keeping your books up to date is a really good way to know where you're at, where your spending is, uh, to, to be able to do this, to be able to work without a line of credit or an operating loan. You have to have your books up to date to know exactly what you're spending when, what your months look like. So I always use last year's numbers to kind of get an idea of where we're going to be because I know from our tracking uh, where we are and where we're going to be based on the number of lands we've had that month. And we use a separate bank account for business expenses. So all I put into that account every month is the amount of money for the mortgage payment so that I know that everything else is farm related and to keep those finances set. It allows us a measure of control over what we're spending, where it's, because I don't want to be able to basically finance the farm completely with my salary. We use that money to expand and that's how we designed it. Um, I haven't figured it out. I really love it. And this is what we use to, to estimate our flow. It's just an Excel spreadsheet um, because I want to be able to adjust it at any point in time. So when hay prices went up this summer, I was able to go in, change two numbers, and it ran the whole scenario through. And that's when I knew that I could not any more lambs this year because we weren't going to be able to afford to buy that quantity of feed. We follow that budget. Um, if anybody's ever done business with Andrew, you know that he will get a price and then we talk about it, we see if it fits in the budget, and then we order it. There's no immediate decisions. Uh, we use scenarios to plan for the worst because we've seen some not so cool things happen. And we always use real numbers. So I don't like guessing, I don't like estimating. I want to use actual real numbers. Okay, just don't bank your numbers on triplets if you're gonna only have twins. Yeah, so this sheep's lying. She does not have four lands. Mm -hmm. Maybe she did, but either way, that's not normal. But she looks like she has that many, but I, I based our numbers off of real numbers and obtainable lamb numbers. So we do track our sheep performance. Um, the farming is, it has risk. Um, if you're doing scenarios, you have to realize that 2020 sheep prices are not normal in the grand scheme of things. Um, Usually I'm using 2013 prices as sort of rock bottom to know that's the most recent lowest prices we have available to us to know, okay, can I sustain a year of that? COVID introduced a new one. Uh, there's a bottleneck for slaughter capacity and just in general that, that our market access, even though we don't direct market, I'm sure those of you who direct market felt this even more than we did, um, there were there were some issues there getting the product to consumers, not just getting it out, out of your barn. And then there's always that environmental risk of drought or a super cold year where things don't grow. And having those having the ability to adjust your budget accordingly and, and caught I just copied the spreadsheet and adjust it per scenario to see where we're going to be or what end up looking like. And for the community plan, actually think about the what ifs. We didn't, we thought we, you know, being young that stupid things would happen, but they do, a car accident comes out of nowhere. And it's, can you do all your chores by yourself? Or you, who, who is going to feed them? Even in COVID, you should be asking yourself, what happens if whoever, if your entire household is struck with this, what 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 are you going to do? Who's going to feed your animals? Because there's um if there's a good odds you're not leaving the couch for a while or worse. Uh we've learned that you shouldn't try to burn the candle at both ends, trying to do everything. So yes, we probably could expand more rapidly if and were to seek off farm employment, but we have found that we're both happier if Somebody's here looking after the sheep and we can give the sheep the absolute best quality care we can afford to. And we can trade labor for things that might be easier if we just spent the cash. 
Uh, we have long-term plans and uh, if you're doing a business plan, always make sure there's some pivot options there. If something were to happen or something changes, what's the next direction? Like you need much more than a one or two year view. We've got five to 10 years usually on the go of where we might want to go. And if something changes, what would we want to do? And um, just a general reminder, of keep your life insurance, your disability insurance policies up to date and ready if you need them, because if they're not there when you need them, it gets really expensive really quickly. Um, so, hmm? yeah. And then for the emergency fund, we keep an actual separate savings account. Uh, we have enough cash there to cover three to six months of both personal and farm expenses in the worst case scenario. I don't believe in borrowing against your lamb crop to finance feeding those lambs. I think that could start a vicious cycle if you're not ahead of the game to start with. And credit cards and line of credits are generally not emergency funds. Um, they're there, you can use them in an emergency, but they do come with an extra cost of interest and you still need a plan to get back out of them. I, I personally use uh, the tax-free savings account because there's no, if you are investing that at a small interest rate or something, it's really nominal right now, but if you were investing it, you don't have to worry about any tax risk if that's where your savings account is with your emergency cash fund. And it's just, it, it's good to have some kind of cash cushion for when things do go sideways and you have nothing, you have no off-farm income for a variety of reasons, uh, or even yes, yeah, you got laid off during this year, it, it's important to have something to fall back on because um, farming is more seasonal. You don't really get a check all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for us, um, we use our off-farm income to lower our debt and reduce our rise on borrowing. So that's where that money goes to, it doesn't go towards seed costs. We always have game plans for any situation. We're really good at thinking of worst case scenarios. Sometimes we overthink those. Um, know your financial information. Don't be months behind in the book. I see this a lot through work and through farm conversations. Just, your bank account is not really a status of how your finances are doing. It's, it's a somewhat of an indicator, but it's not how you're actually doing. So being up to date also allows you to make decisions quickly when necessary and adjust accordingly. And overall, we just stay up to date on market prices, trends, where things are going. Like in the land market, most of it's just the holidays, how they keep moving. And we keep notes on everything to see what we can approve the following year. Yeah, so that's that part of the presentation. Um, if you have questions, I'll take them, try my best to answer them. Yeah. No questions? No discussion? Um, oh, whatever. Sabrina has a question, and then I'll ask mine. You, you can answer Sabrina's on the online there. Uh, not currently. Um, we're talking about maybe doing pre orders, but it's mainly through some, a really good friend of mine. Uh, she's, yeah, she's a, a Racky and her family has asked if we could get them some lamb products because where they are, there's not actually, they're in uh, North Bay, so there's not a lot of lamb producers <coughs> around there and obviously good friends, but no actual plans at this point for direct marketing. So we, so we've decided we don't really have time to invest in the marketing aspect and connecting with consumers. So we're 
focusing on producing land at this point because it's really intense to do all the direct marketing. It's a lot of work from what it's been told. Yeah, so my question is going to sound a bit funny, perhaps, especially to you at being an accountant and all. Um, I'm very bad at following, like you say, you don't be behind on the books. I wait the full year before I fill out my books, so I know you're going to cringe. Uh, do you have a trick to encourage people? <laughs> like, how do you, like, do you go weekly, monthly? Like, I have an off, so, a farm job and I'm by myself, so it's a bit harder, but I'd like to get into a good habit of maybe being more proactive about this. Do you have any tricks, any suggestions based on your training that you can? Yes. So I use, um, so I, I use a free accounting software called Wave, and it allows me to import my bank statements, which I could, I could connect it, but I don't feel professionally comfortable with that. So I use the download feature from my bank and I can download my monthly bank statement and then I can import it into my accounting software. And then that aspect's already done. All I have to do is go in and assign each one to the category as needed and then just assign tax as needed. And quite often I try to enter the invoices shortly around the time we would pay them anyway. So that next time I get around to uploading the statement, all the invoices are there. I just have to match them. So the program I use is Canadian and it's called Wave Accounting and it's all online. So Wave is in W-A-V-E? Is that what you're? Yeah. Okay. And it's, it's pretty good it's it's free so i like free things <laughs> yeah well, who doesn't thanks <laughs> yeah and it's all online so it's fairly easy if you're working with your accountant you can send them an invite to it and then they can go and download whatever you need from it and uh it has a personal component to it as well which i like so i have a tab um for the business and then i have a tab for personal so i can upload all of our personal expenses as well and i track those completely too because that that is what i do um so i know exactly where we're spending what and then i know at the end of the year where the money went okay so. thanks yeah it's it's just habit overall um you were to try to enter it when you pay the invoices at the same time, that's probably the easiest because you're already sitting there looking at those invoices to write out the checks. So if you're typing them into the computer or your spreadsheet at the same time, then that part of it is done. So, they do a bit of this, but it's uh, so the question is, do you use cost of production? If when, if not, why? Can you explain some of the methods you use to track, example, uh, cost of raising a lamb to market? So usually if I'm doing a cost of production, it's sort of an on the spot calculation for that point in time. So example would be I can calculate it for the last group we produced because I know the feed that was assigned to the we track the feed that was fed to that pen and then we know what the cost was but in general I don't have an ongoing count of my cost of production that say updates every month it's more of every time I'm going to make a management decision I add our numbers to a spreadsheet that I built to calculate out the cost for the year but overall, because I'm, I already have my budget based on the cost of production, I'm not calculating it all the time. And only when I want to see why is our budget out of whack or what's going on there. Or um, when the hay prices spiked this summer, I was adjusting the cost of production with the new prices using the existing numbers. 
And usually we, yeah, usually we have lambs going out on sort of a rolling basis when we do an extended lambing. So it's kind of hard to track an exact cost of production for that uh, animal. And it's probably just a, again, a career thing. I'm used to looking at it on a quarterly, monthly basis over an overall financial situation. I don't know any other questions. Let's see if I can pull up the spreadsheet. Hold on. I'm seeing if I can get one of the spreadsheets. Uh, the speed by loan, I looked at it, we don't qualify. Um, so I didn't go further with it. Because you need uh, you need forty thousand dollars worth of expenses from the first of January to the first of March to qualify, and that yeah, I have that much expenses. So thank you, Colleen. No, it, it's mainly been forced on us. I mean, I was a saver by nature, but when we ended up with, was it, yeah, we spent three months without any income and a whole bunch of dying sheep. So uh, we had to figure out how to survive. Okay. It's not 40 grand for the entire year. Um, uh, I can say that with professional confidence. All right, there we go. We have got a budget. This is an old one. Let's see if I can share it. See if it'll do this. Let me see if I can do this. Okay. There we go. Here is it back? Yeah, it's back up. Thanks. Okay. So let me see if I can scroll up here. So this is this is an old one, but it's the one I can find the fastest. And uh, so for us, this one's based off of use, of the number of use, and then the number we expected to be weaning, because that's the number that counts our, for us, our mortality is not that bad after weaning. Um, and then I adjust the marketing uh, accordingly and how many I want to keep and the number of acres that we currently run, because I had land rent and things figured into there. And then it just kind of goes down to light lambs, um, calls. For Katadins, we get paid pretty well for calls, so I can usually be overly optimistic there. Um, they often categorize our sheep as lambs and pertaining, or they put them in as goats, that's uh, happened too. And then you get a call from the ATQ wondering what happened to your sheep. Uh, the ATQ, for those who are unaware, is the Agricultural Trace Agricultural Traceability Quebec. It's where we got our pegs from. And then, yeah, we've got hay here, um, different kind of bedding costs. I always do an error margin. I, I like 10%. 
and then uh, yeah, mortgage costs, and I keep a couple of footnotes there. So, yeah. I don't know what this Okay. Yeah, if there's a question in the chat, I'm sorry, I can't see it right now. It's not letting me take a look. Oh, there we go. Yeah. I you know I'm not the only one who sheep gets turned into goats randomly. Yeah, this is just a brief example. This is a very, very condensed budget. I think it might actually be the one the bank got. Um, yeah, we we trim our costs down as absolutely low as we can go. So that's a big question. Uh, so <laughs> are we using sheet management software? Yes, we use BioTrack from Egg Sites. Um, the BioTrack works for us in that we can add modules as needed. So. Uh, we just recently figured out how to weigh all of our lamps and record all that information. Uh, we're still using the notebook method there, but we use it to track uh, production and uh, pedigrees because we do run a number of rams and we try to use them in breeding pairs. So it's kind of important to know who's related to who, and we're now using it to base our culling decisions off of that so um, and we use we rely on the ACQ data for inventory purposes because they make it uh, they, they make it mandatory so it's called bio track it's by egg site and uh, it's it's a software program like you manage yeah you manage is the other one that's big so. <laughs> And we have a small scanner. Um, it wasn't quick connects. Yeah. It, it connects to an app on, well, I just got it to work on the tablet. So it connects to an app and it turns it into an Excel sheet. And then I can upload that Excel sheet to BioTrack because I, we don't have good internet. So I didn't feel the need to pay for BioTrack off. Uh, on, it's all online, but for the offline version, I didn't feel like paying for that when I can just do it in an Excel sheet and upload it all. So we do track our sheet a lot to know who's related to who. Yeah. Um, Andrew likes these little notebooks, if anybody's familiar with them. So. Oh, a lot. So a sheet runs off. I think I can do it. So, yeah. Um, other questions? Yeah. <laughs> he does too, Diane. He's, he's always got one in his pocket, I think, right now. Oh, yeah, we've got one, two. Got two just up here that I took all the dead stock out of. So we have to report all our dead stock for traceability requirements. So I have to keep that up to date. And I have to keep our lambing has to be all reported. Um, this is all reported to the ATQ. So we do have to keep track of year tags and birth dates. And, and then it just becomes an easy extension to keep track of everything else. Uh, we've now switched to actually a clipboard um, with a spreadsheet that matches the bio track information. And I'm moving the spreadsheet to the tablet when I get a chance to just using Google Sheets. So um, I could track colors, but no. I'm not sure I want to because then I'd be tempted to keep sheets based on their colors. So, yeah. That's a benefit of the cabins. I have like every color you can dream of. The Jacobs are pretty though. They've got that. So 
So Colleen has a question. How soon after birth, death, sale, do you need to report to the ATQ? Uh, you can upload spreadsheet. So, all right. Okay, do so you want to see an actual spreadsheet that I do? Or? Um, so, I think you're supposed to do it within seven days of birth or 30 days of birth. So, I try to keep on top of that. Um, I usually just make a list and I can go. They have, what is it called? Simply Trace. They have an app and it's a web browser thing. And I can go in there and I can add the tag and the birth date and the gender. And then it pops up. I have tried the email in option where you can email in the entire spreadsheet. That always resulted in errors. So now I just do it myself. Uh, for deaths, I think you're supposed to you're supposed to report those within 30 days. I'm more of a report them every six months type of person. I don't think they've gotten too upset with me as long as I keep it on track with uh, the ASRA reports that come out. So. ASTRA is, as mentioned earlier, the income stabilization program, and they do track your sheep, they track your ewes, they track, actually, what? There's a sheet that they send you, and it has the number of ewes you have, it has a lamb, it has the number of ewe lambs you have, uh, because we have to pay a fee based on those numbers, and it has a list of deaths, and it has a list of sales, so basically every time they mail me, I try to make sure I'm up to date and I make sure I'm up to date for the 31st. And as far as sales go, sales, uh, the ATQ is the check box sales barn. Yeah. So the sales barn does everything for the ones we sell through the sales barn, except for apparently that time we loaded a whole bunch of calls with Ontario tags. Found that out last week. When I, did. I had sheep that I didn't have anymore on the ATQ. Um, but it turned out it was an entire load of Ontario tag use and they just didn't bother to report them. That's okay. So then you just log in, you report the sales. And uh, if I sell sales privately, I do have to report that relatively frequently because most of my sales have been going to other Quebec producers who then want to add those animals to their inventory so i need to go in and report them and i can just link it up to their um they have producer number yeah they have a producer number there it's like pr oh and then it has a number after it so in terms of frequently budgeting farm expenses do you feel that being ex this is a question being accelerated and having multiple lands gives some assurance to your cash flow and resiliency yes this is part of why we do uh, our attempt at accelerated. We have tried the STAR system. Um, we might try it again. We tried it starting in 2017. It didn't go very well for us. We struggled. Our sheep struggled. Um, we find that cattens are not as, or at least the ones we have, they're not as keen on doing it at that level of accelerated. But having accelerated lambing, we have ewes uh, that do really well on it. The Romanoff, they're phenomenal at it. Uh, they're also good at out-of-season breeding without assistance. Um, so we find that we want to have lambs for sale most of the year, and it is for cash flow purposes, knowing that those next lambs are coming. So this year we had sales starting, actually, yes. Yeah, Starting in okay. Easter, yeah, we had we had February. We had a small gap after that, and then from Easter straight on through till December, we usually had uh, a group or two ready to go every single month. Yeah, so we do weigh every week and work. Yeah, we're, so we we try to sell. About once a month, if possible, or more often. Um, yeah, in the springtime, it's every week or every other week. We just have a tucker we hire that comes in. He, he goes past about weekly with his loop, so. So he comes and picks them all up, and it saves us uh, time and ex the expense of having um, 
a licensed vehicle and trailer to go to and from. But yes, um, we, we rely on. So we don't ship less than 10 lambs at a time because of the additional cost. We get charged per head. The more we sell, the lower the cost per head. So the, uh, the sweet point for us is 10. We need 10 lambs for the trucker to show up. Um, so that's the group we will go for. And so most of our groups are from 10. I think our biggest ones this year we had. Yeah, we had about four groups of 20. So that was that was very exciting for us. That was the first time we were able to sell 20 lambs at a time. So, and that again helps with the cost, and it works out really well at Field Farm. We can do nice work. So, the more lambs, the better. Um, I know it's often a thing, especially if you read the Facebook pages, that they say Katadins get discounted at the sales barn. We have found that seems to be a sales barn specific problem. And it's not a problem for us anymore. Um, they they don't seem to really care anymore. If I look at the average prices that they pay, uh, they just and, and with cross and enrollment off, they do have more of a wall look to them. Yeah. So and they really like the Dorfers. So adding in terminal Dorfers worked out great that way. But we don't feel we're getting discounted for having pair sheet. Uh, so question here is instructions. Do you, what instructions do you give the sales barn about the size of the roof to fail? Nothing. The color, we spray paint them that they're going on a truck. Sometimes we have other sheep farms, animals going on the same load just to make it easier on the trucker. And then we simply tell them that all of the orange sheep belong to somebody else. All of the non-orange sheep are ours. And that's about it. We trust their judgment to group them accordingly. And usually they get sold in lots of three to five. Three to five. A lot of them are going to direct buyers. They're not going to be bought. Other questions? What would be the consequence if you sent five you la uh, five lambs to Greeley that weighed eighty five pounds? That would be heavy. That would be well. I got a heavy. phone call. Just a phone yes, call. So they would be considered a heavy lamb. I get a phone call, or I get a note on my next uh, ASRA document. So I'm currently arguing with them because uh, they have two lambs that I know I sold, and they say they can't find them. That's fun. Um, but in general. Usually what I end up doing is if they're too heavy, I say, yes, I'm aware that they were too heavy, it won't happen again. And they just strike them from the list of eligible lambs. But if you sell too many, there can be a fine, there can be penalties. Um, you can get phone calls. Uh, in 2018, when we had a problem, we got phone calls asking what's going on. Do you ask? Actually, they were nice enough to ask if we needed any sort of support if we needed somebody to talk to because they were very concerned about what our sheep numbers were doing and they will also call you if you're selling lamb fast at a higher weight than what their birth date would estimate them to be so if you if you have super awesome sheep that are gaining like i don't know 1.2 pounds a day they might probably call you if that's not normal for you. So they're, they follow up. And if we sold too many of them, we, the, the guy told me I would face a $20 a head penalty. So we try not to do that. They let one or two or three or four slip through, but they're not real happy that you do it. <laughs> 
Uh, so to Diane's question about the Romanoffs, so adding the half Romanoffs, uh, they look like a wool sheep for the most part. Um, I'll try to find a picture of a good one. I don't know. I'll find one in a second or so. They, they basically look like little fuzzy things with short tails, and that works pretty well for selling them. Um, Colleen's question, what if you send your lambs to another auction besides Ember and Greeley? Do they forward the tag information to the APC also plus weight? Yes, there is a number of sales barns that are registered with the APQ. They had a list for this. They had a list. Yeah, there's a list of approved sales barns in Ontario that forward the tag information and the weights to the ATQ, therefore minimizing those reporting requirements. Embrum's on the approved list. Cobden, which is Renfrew Pontiac. Is it Renfrew? Either way. But yeah, Cobden's on the approved list. Cookstown. Cooks. Olak. Katie. Yeah, Katie's not for land, though. No, okay. Yeah, yeah but. Those are the ones, those are the sales barns that are approved to take uh, Quebec tags. And if you didn't, if you sold them otherwise, you'd have to send in a report of some sort, I think. Um, usually, the one, usually the ones we sell privately, I just, uh, I call the ATRA or FABQ and I go, hey, I sold those privately. I understand that they are not eligible for the program. And then that's, that's all good. Um, Cause they generally don't have a problem if I say it, they're, they're ineligible. So. If you have other questions, let me know. I've got the chat up and running, obviously. Technically, yes, but then you have back to Fred's original question. You get a phone call or a complaint, or they're just lumpy. Um, they're ineligible. Um, if you're completely not on the program and you reside along the border, and you sell heavy, they tend to leave you alone. If you don't participate in any programs, don't want to participate in any program, they're nice that way. Yeah. Try to find the half Romanoffs here. Okay, here, we got a half Romanoff. Okay, short tail. Share screen. This is what most of our sheep look like on their halves. Did it show up? Yeah, I see two lambs and a U. That's what I see. Yep. That's about right. So that those would be those are the half Romanoffs and what they look like compared to some of the colored ones I had in the slideshow. Yeah. And uh, one of the lamps is probably a half worker, but that is pretty much what we sell most of the time. They're nice little white butter bowls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fact they're half woolly, I think it makes the cell barn people happy. Well, the buyers, I should say. But they must know it's probably. your sheep. After a while, I'm sure you've, like, they kind of know, don't they? It's usually consistent buyers and like if I compare our uh, our check sheet to the reports from the sales barn, we're always on the top side of the average. Like it's very rare we're below the average price. And if we are, I'm aware that I sold animals that didn't look as pretty as they maybe should have. Mm -hmm. So do you find and it's they, always the same buyers that go for your your animals? Yeah, like on most the of the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's pretty it's much the same, the same for same us. Buyer. Yeah, and uh, they really, really like our cull. Um, cool. Yeah, Mr. Beast buys most of those, and they really like 
So that's another thing with us keeping all these ewe lambs. Sometimes we get to breeding and it doesn't work for whatever reason. I'm not as sad about selling them because 90% of the time I get all of my money plus uh, a healthy margin back on them anyway, even if I am selling them at 16, 18 months old, because they really like those catadins and they're about usually they're around 110 pounds and they will pay us. Yeah, this year we had some that there's some cull ewes that went for heavy, just lambs. heavy lambs and they were running, some of them were running over the $3 mark. So I, I can't complain about that. So it, it adds to our expansion strategy in that our culls get compensated in a way that doesn't hurt us. We've also had a call for like $28, but I thought that was better than dead and she was healthy. She just wasn't free. So. Yeah. And other questions? Things? Thank you, Ursina and Andrew. Very interesting and appreciate the, uh, the nice visuals and pictures and uh, all the information that you shared for us. Yeah. I just wondered, there's a number of people on the call tonight whose names I don't recognize. And I just wondered maybe we could do an informal roll call or round table of everyone introducing themselves and just telling us a bit about your own farm. Charlotte. <laughs> Hi, I'm Charlotte. Um, my, my dad and I are located near Beechburg and we have about 180 sheep. Um, Yersina and I actually were in junior farmers in school together. So I'm glad that I could uh, pop in on this call because I, I think we're in district nine actually. So I'm, I'm not from this district. But thank you so much. This was such a lovely chat and it was super informative. Yeah. If it wasn't COVID, I'd say come over. You're not that far away, but. I know. We'll have to plan a tour sometime soon and you're always welcome here as well. Yeah. So I guess I'll go. I'm Wanda Williams and we live in Cumberland and I have a total of six sheep. So I'm very much just, um, it's, it's definitely a hobby. We do cash crop farming, beekeeping and, you know, other things, but it's always one of those things I, I wonder if someday we'll, you know, get more sheep. So that's why I'm starting to listen in on some of these and see what I can learn. So thank you. I appreciate uh, everything you had to share tonight. Thanks for listening. I'll go. I'm Colleen and I am in District 10, not far from uh, Kempville and Osgood area. And uh, my husband and our three boys raise uh, four purebred breeds, Hampshire, Suffolk, Rito Arcot and Dorset. None of the breeds that Ursina and Andrew spoke about tonight. Um, and um, yeah, so we, uh, we, we keep about 450 ewes in, in the, that Kempville area. Yeah. Okay, I'll go next. Um, I'm Bridget Mooney Grimes. Um, I'm the treasurer for District 10. Um, my farm is located near Hexton, between Hexton and Sap Mountain, which is between Kempville and Winchester. Um, 
I used to have meat sheep, but in uh, 2019, I decided to switch to wool sheep, meaning sheep that produce wool um, as opposed to meat. Um, basically, I have Gotlands and I have a few um, Jacobs for, that I bought from Vanessa. Um, the Gotlands came from Veronica in uh, Dover Farms in Southern Ontario. And um, currently I have about 15 sheep, but I'm looking to get maybe between 20 and 30 that would of, of the Gotlands. That would be my uh, next step. And currently I sell uh, skirted fleeces. Scotland are, are, are short-tailed sheep too, or am I confusing them with the Yeah, no, they are short-tailed, you're correct. Okay. Yeah, they're originally from Sweden, but yeah, they do have short tails. so I don't have to dock them, which is great. <laughs> yeah, that's something we don't have to do either, both in short tails and because they're hair sheep, they don't really get security and fly strikes from the concern. Nice. Sabrina, where we get our Dorfers from? Hi. Hi, Esther, Ursina. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Uh, <laughs> I'm located in Cobden. Uh, we started out with three sheep, purebred Dorper sheep in 2014, because our children were in the 4-H sheep club. Uh, so now we, were, we are up to 33 ewes uh, and four rams. I kind of have too many of them right now. But, oh well, uh, we're expecting uh, 10 ewes to lamb next month and the rest to lamb in March. Um, we, we really like the, the purebred Dorper. Um, they're a very calm, easy to handle sheep, which that's why I like, you know, just having enough that I can handle. I'm, I'm not a young person. Um, so, uh, I can pretty much tie them all and trim their hooves and vaccinate them all. And they're all very easy to handle. Don't mind me. I had to throw one of Ralph's sons up for you. Oh, is that, oh, that's one of Ralph's. Yes. Oh, <laughs> Yes, I uh, sold a couple rams to Ursina, uh, Ralph and Diesel, um, uh, and she keeps coming back for more rams, so it's all good. We use them for terminal, and they work out really well, and yeah. And that would be off a F1 Romanov mother for anybody wondering about the mother on that side of the cross. No one else is going. Um, uh, this, I'm Fred Baker. I'm older than dirt. Uh, I've been raising sheep for 40 years. Uh, and I wanted to thank you for uh, being so open about the challenges you've had and your financial uh, philosophy, which I congratulate you for and appreciate. It matches my own. And uh, you've imparted a lot of really good information tonight and uh, people should pay attention. And thank you. Thank you for listening. I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm Patrick Doherty uh, from District 3. Uh, we met there at a few meetings uh, when you were down that way <laughs> years <Yeah>. ago. <laughs> Anyways, I raise around uh, 250 ewes now and uh, I started milking this year. So. <laughs> That's what yeah. I do. You have something slightly different going on too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Devin Winsink and I have uh, 10 Dorsets and I'm just in Newington. Okay. A good start. 
So I will read Heather here. Uh, Heather says, I'm in District 6 in Ontario, and we have about 50 used most Dorito. Hi, Heather. Trying hard to grow on a budget and playing some of the same techniques with all of our contribution going to expansion. Trying hard to get to 250. We direct market all of our land plus buy in feeders. We aim to cap our direct market at 100 lambs due to the amount of time and labor required to sell that way. Keen on learning better finance. Thanks for tuning in, Heather. Thank you, yeah. got everybody. Vanessa, you introduce your Jacob, or do we just assume everybody, you just assume everybody knows your Jacob? <laughs> well, yeah, we have a small farm of uh, a mix of Jacob and Sucks over here in District 10. I'm also the secretary for the area, and uh... yeah, Ellen. You done burping? You want to talk or nothing? I'm sorry, our dog just started barking at something outside. <laughs> he started asking, so I don't have anything more to add than that. I don't think this is fantastic. You guys did such a good job. It's it's very clear for the amount of. Um, response and just interaction we've had with everyone this has been fantastic thank you guys so much thanks for having us um i'm glad the internet cooperated because uh, i was using google present and i was a little concerned that it might stall out on us some um, lovely rural satellite internet here uh, which i'm sure everybody can relate to so it's a lot of fun yeah but Thanks for having us. Um, if you've got questions and things, uh, I have a blog. So if you're looking, I think there's at least one of the, there's a budget spreadsheet on the blog. It's uh, farmingfrontiers.ca or just Google the farming frontiers. And a fair bit of, there's a couple of different spreadsheets and things there. Um, a lot of just different conversations uh going on it's just yeah whatever you need there um i write business plans that's kind of my sideline thing so that is how i ended up with i had to learn a lot to write my own business plan and then i found out that's a struggle everybody has so now i share that and that's how you can reach me or facebook messenger works too <laughs> 